Hey guys, welcome to part three of our Aces Explained series. Today, we're gonna to build on the theory that we talked about in part one and the project setup that we went over in part two and get into proper grading. Now, in a lot of ways, what we've done thus far is the easy part. It's really just a matter of learning and applying some new concepts. But for those of us who are used to grading by hand, our task today is a bit trickier. We need to take our existing concepts and rewrite them in order to grade effectively in ACES. The good news is you only have to do this once and it's gonna dramatically level up your grades. So let's take a look at my go-to principles and tools for grading in ACES. Okay, so let's dive into this ACES grade and look at how the process differs from grading by hand. I wanna give you guys three principles today that you can use to guide your approach. And the first of those, we've actually already teased a little bit in part two, that is to think and work globally. What do I mean when I say that? Well, if you guys recall, in part two, at the timeline level of our node graph, we did two things. We first did our technical output transform to get into our Rec 709 display color space. But I also applied this look here in these two nodes here, and we can see the components. Uh, if we go to shot number four and toggle our halation, we can see it kicking on and off here in our headlights. And then the main driver of this look is really this contrast node, which we can see easily here on shot number one. If I flip this off and then on, this represents my sort of overall creative preference for where I wanna see this scene go. The amount of contrast, the amount of color, the color temperature, the exposure, the brightness, the darkness, wherever I creatively wanna see this scene go, I've attempted to cook as much of that as possible into this overall look that again, because it's happening here at the timeline level, is hitting not one, but all of my shots. So that's principle number one, to think and work globally, which we've already started to do by applying this look in part two. And as a result, we're ready to go back to our clip level and start to grade shot by shot, which leads me right to the second principle, which is to think and work photographically. That's something you guys have heard me talk about before. I've done videos on it before, but it's maybe the most important of the three principles we're going to discuss today. So what exactly do I mean when I say work photographically? I'm really talking about the difference between the way I was initially trained when I began working as a colorist, which is to go over to my primaries here and grab for my lift, gamma, and gain, maybe turn them up or down, maybe change my RGB balance like so and move things down to the lower right or up to the upper left, whatever the case may be. There's nothing wrong with these kinds of adjustments if you're getting results that you're pleased with, but they are very graphical in nature and they really have no real world counterpart. They only exist and they only make sense in the realm of a 2D image. So my goal when I'm grading is to keep things in the realm of physical light and the realm of the photographic for as long as possible. And my two key prongs for that are exposure and color temperature. And we're gonna talk about both of those. Let's start with exposure. So prior to Resolve 17, I would have suggested that you use offset as your sort of rough analog for exposure. Here in Resolve 17, we now have an even better tool, which is in the HDR palette here, on the far right at this global wheel. This exposure slider down here is very close to a photometrically accurate exposure adjustment. What exactly does that mean? That means that when I move this slider to the left or to the right, I'm gonna get very similar results to what I would have gotten if I had shut or closed my lens when I was framing this scene. But there's actually one more step we need to go through to make this slider work correctly, which we haven't done yet in this series. Let's go to our project settings for a moment. And I wanna look at my color science and timeline color space dropdowns. So as you guys know, we're doing this ACES workflow in a fully manual way, meaning that we are specifying each and every color space transformation. And that's why we have DaVinci YRGB set up as our color science. This simply tells Resolve, hey, don't worry about the color management. I got it, whatever needs to happen, I'm gonna take care of it. But because we've done things in this way, Resolve actually has no idea what color space we are working in. And in order for tools like the HDR palette to work correctly, it actually needs to know that information. So I want to specify in this timeline color space dropdown menu, 
not Rec 709 Scene, which is the default, but ACES CCT, which if you guys will recall from parts one and two, is our working color space. And once I have saved that selection, now all of my color space aware tools that are here inside of my high dynamic range palette will be aware of the correct color space and give me the correct adjustments for my working color space. So now that we've done this, we can go back down to this exposure slider and we can adjust things wherever we wanna see them live. Exposure can of course be a corrective or a creative measure. In this case, this is a perfectly nicely exposed image, but I think we could actually pull some exposure just in terms of our overall creative direction for the scene. Something like this I think looks really nice. Let's go full screen and I'm gonna go off and now back on. Just a little bit moodier, I like that a lot. Next up within this thinking and working photographically principle, I wanna talk about color temperature for a moment. So let's go over here to shot number 10. And let's say for a moment that we wanna shift the balance of colors in this frame. They're just a little bit too blue at the moment. Now, as I mentioned, the way that I was trained as a colorist initially would lead me to go back over here to my primaries palette and probably grab for my gain wheel or my gamma and nudge things to the upper left to try to get some warmer colors into there. And once again, nothing wrong with that, but there's no analog to it out in the real world. And it's very easy to inadvertently go more green or more pink than we really want to. And it's tough to kind of have a scale and a sense of what we're doing and to modulate our adjustments as we're working our way through our grade. So my preference is to think photographically and simply adjust my color temperature in the same way that I might if I could go back to the moment that this scene was being shot and say, hey, let's re-rate the camera for a different color temperature. So if I go back over to my HDR zones palette and go to my temperature knob, I can move things to the right and get a warmer image out of the deal. And this works roughly in terms of degrees of Kelvin. So I'm gonna go quite a ways here just so it's easy for us to see. And let's go full screen and see how that's feeling. So I'm going off and now on. I think that's really nice. That's all I'm really wanting. It's just a little splash of warmth in here, a little bit less of that pure blue living uh, almost completely in the lower right hand quadrant here. So that's the second prong of that principle of thinking and working photographically. We've got exposure and we've got color temperature. And the last principle that I wanna leave you guys with today is to think and work as broadly and simply as possible. So let's take a look at an example. Let's just go over here to shot 10's neighbor, number 11, and let's quickly drop our exposure a little bit like so. And now I wanna focus in on this kind of yellow kicker that I've got here on the lower right-hand side of this male character's face. I feel like it's a little too greeny yellowy for me and I'd like to rotate it a bit more toward a goldy orange color. So in the past, what I might have done would be to go to my qualifier and then eyedropper that region and then look at my highlight mode and kind of refine this key until I've got it selecting the region that I'm interested in. Again, nothing wrong with this, but this is a very narrow correction. It's likely to introduce noise and it's unlikely to travel perfectly between different shots. So I wanna try and skin this in a bit of a broader, simpler way. The way we're gonna do that is to delete this node, do a new node, and let's go over here to our curves. And I wanna look specifically at my hue versus hue curves. So if I zoom in on my image, once again, eyedropper in that region, and look at the goalposts that I'm given and grab this center control point. And I'm gonna look here at my vector scope as I make this adjustment. I'm gonna move this control point upward and try to get a little bit closer to that skin tone line, like so. Easy to overdo this, I don't wanna go nuts. That's something else you guys will notice is tools like these curves. A little goes a lot further when you're working in a log scene referred model like we are now. So really this hue rotation of like, you know, 12, 13 degrees is all I'm looking for, but there's something else interesting happening here that's worth discussing. We are rotating away from a more secondary yellow and toward a more primary red. And as a result, we are perceptually getting more saturation in addition to that hue shifting. And that's something that you're commonly gonna see when you're moving from a secondary toward a primary, things are gonna feel more saturated. And the opposite is also true. When you're moving from a primary toward a secondary, things are gonna feel less saturated. So often we wanna counter that with a bit of a saturation adjustment. And that's what I'd like to do here. So we've just done this hue versus hue. Let's go to our hue versus sat. Eyedropper this same region, 
grab our control point and tuck things in just a little bit so that now when I go full screen and turn this off and then on, my adjustment's actually much more subtle. It's almost hard to spot, but it's scratching my itch. It's getting that hue of that kick light away from that kind of greeny yellow and more toward a goldy yellow. And if I turn off my entire stack on this shot, like so, so here we were before we touched anything, here we are after that exposure and that hue adjustment, this shot is actually a really good example of kind of the degree of adjustment that I hope to make by the time I'm grading individual shots in a color managed scene referred workflow like ACES. I want to do as much as possible with my color management. I then want to take that further by applying my global look, thinking and working globally. And then I want to think and work photographically and think and work as simply as possible to get things over the finish line. But ideally, I'm doing as little as possible by the time I get down to the individual shot level. So this is really just a taste of grading in ACES and working scene referred and color managed. But if you guys can remember these three principles to think and work globally, think and work photographically and think and work simply, you're going to be well on your way to getting much better grades on your images. I promised you guys at the end of part two that I'd show you today just how simple things can be when you've got a good color management foundation. And I hope you're starting to see what I meant by that. But the truth is, simple doesn't always mean easy. It takes practice and patience to distill your grading process down to this essential form. My ultimate goal for this series is to use ACES as a portal for you guys into the world of color management, scene referred workflows, and true image authorship. If you feel overwhelmed by all this, good. You're gonna find that the more you learn about color grading, the more you discover you've yet to learn. I hope you enjoy this journey as much as I have. See you next time.